Stars Arena, the Avalanche clone of Frentech, was drained for $3 million by a hacker. ThorSwap's token drops 40% in a PR crisis. Wang's testimony buried SBF. And Caroline Allison, SBF's on and off girlfriend, is set to testify next. And finally, Joe Rogan praises Bitcoin on his podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Crypto Daily. Um, so, Bitcoin today at almost 28K. We've been kind of hovering in like this 27K range, obviously, now uh, sitting at the uh, top end of that range. I think most of us are looking for a breakthrough um, to kind of see it push 30K, or maybe we'll push down to 26 and, and test that 25, 26K level again. Uh, not really sure, but, uh, you know, obviously a quiet market this morning. Um, so Stars Arena, which is the new social fly, social fly platform, uh, essentially just a clone of friend tech where uh, you can buy tickets of, of other users uh, and earn trading fees, uh, was just drained completely to zero dollars. Uh, I think it was like one dollar that was left in the Stars Arena main account uh, in the main smart contract um, due to a breach in their smart contract. This was actually the second breach. Um, so if you've kind of followed an ongoing story, there was a breach, um, I think the day before, so yesterday, um, that was a, a much smaller breach and only like $2,000 was taken. Uh, but now, you know, there was a, there was a full scale breach of the smart contract. So, um, some $3 million worth of avalanche tokens, which is a, uh, AVAX, uh, were drained, leaving stars arena with just under $1 in funds after the attacker, uh, obviously attacked the smart contract. So, you know, some users were earning like a thousand, you know, avalanche tokens in, in trading fees and avalanche is like right around ten dollars. So that's uh, ten grand. Um, and essentially the way the app works is uh, both apps, speaking of friend tech, um, let users purchase keys or shares of popular X users in turn for access uh, to a closed chat room, which may offer various privileges to those holders. So uh, basically the way it works is like. You connect your X account and then you get um, you can you can start selling, you know, basically keys, which are just basically shares uh, in like a private chat room that you control as a creator. And obviously, like if a popular creator uh, goes over to the platform, creates, you know, their profile and then starts posting stuff in the private chat room. Uh, theoretically, those keys get worth more and more. People start trading them and speculating on them. And in the secondary market, as they're traded, the creator earns a share of the fees and the platform earns a share of the fees. So, uh, you know, it, it definitely is a, it's definitely engineered for virality. Um, it's also engineered for a lot of rug pulling. Um, obviously, friend tech has not had like a huge rug pull in terms of like the main smart contract like uh, uh, Stars Arena has, but it has had various creators, you know, come in, make a bunch of money and leave. So, uh, it is a interesting model, definitely, uh, you know, something that I think people should be wary of. I think there's going to be a lot of clones like this. This kind of seems to be, and Binance just came out with something that's somewhat like this. They haven't done the whole ticketing thing yet. Uh, I assume that they probably will at some point. Um, but this seems to be one of the new narratives of the, you know, crypto market where, you know, obviously we saw like the whole altcoin explosion and all these, you know, cloned DeFi platforms in the next uh, cycle. So that was obviously the last cycle where we saw, you know, all these like pancake swap clones and stuff. Um, so, you know, some of them might have merit, some of them might not. You really have to look at the team, look at the actual project behind it um, and and just be careful. So that's my my advice going forward is I assume there's going to be a lot more clones like this. There's This is not the first, uh, sorry, this is not the last Stars Arena. Uh, there's going to be plenty more like it. So uh, if you ever do get involved, and I actually did sign up for it uh, just to kind of play around with it. Um, you know, but I obviously didn't put any money into anything on the platform. So if you do get involved, just be very cautious is my, uh, my professional opinion, let's call it. Uh, so Thorchain has been making, you know, a lot of headlines lately, uh, because the FTX hacker, uh, who stole, um, about $290 million from FTX, uh, 10 months ago, started to move those funds, uh, just at the end of September. So. Uh, one of the places he started moving the funds through is Thorchain. He was swapping from, you know, ETH to Bitcoin, for example, uh, through the Thorchain decentralized liquidity pools. Um, ThorSwap is a centralized UI for Thorchain. So they commonly get, you know, misconstrued because obviously the names are very similar. They also have very similar token names. So ThorSwap has a token called Thor. Um, and then obviously their UI is called ThorSwap. And then you've got Thorchain and their token is called Rune. So a lot of people get confused with those. Um, Thorchain, the decentralized liquidity protocol has had zero downtime 
uh, and has not censored anything. You know, it's it's fully operational and always has been uh, in terms of like through this whole period. ThorSwap, though, decided to shut down trading on their centralized UI uh, because, you know, they didn't want to support the, you know, they didn't want to support malicious or ill-gotten funds going through the platform. You know, they're very heavily US uh, based. So it caused kind of a rift in the community, which is obviously very pro decentralization. Um, so I'll read you this tweet from uh, from Chad Brad uh, Bereford, who's obviously one of the uh, the key leaders in in Thorchain. ThorSwap will be back soon. People are definitely overreacting to the news. Like all DeFi projects, UIs are centralized and getting into a fight with officials to to fut futility uh, protect a centralized UI isn't a battle worth having. They made the right choice. Live through the day so you can build for tomorrow. This shit ain't checkers, it's chess. So um, that was a funny way to use that word. Um, but essentially, the you know, the idea there is the same. Uh, you know, centralized UIs can always get attacked. That's something you always got to keep in mind. But the back end needs to be fully decentralized. It needs to be completely unattackable. So obviously, um, you know, this is kind of how ThorChain and ThorSwap work. That's their relationship. Um, there's, I think there's around like 22, 23 UIs for ThorChain. Um, so this is far from bad for ThorChain. You know, I, in my opinion, it, it has no bearing on ThorChain itself. This is obviously a centralized UI that decided not to support something so that they didn't have to fight with, you know, local officials about it. Um, so probably a good move from their perspective. Uh, and, you know, obviously a lot of trading volumes moving to other UIs and it's going to move to other UIs. They're going to lose a lot of market share. So it's not something that they were probably happy about doing, um, but we'll see how this kind of develops. Uh, and then we saw the testimony from uh, Wang, which Gary Wang, which was one of the, um, you know, top officials at uh, FTX uh, and Alameda Research. So um, Ellison, Caroline Ellison, uh, is like the on and off girlfriend of, of FTX and also the CEO of Alameda Research, which was like one of the companies that uh, SBF oversaw. It was Alameda and then FTX. Um, so... Uh, Caroline Allison and Gary Wang both pled guilty to multiple charges of fraud in December. Uh, the only one who didn't plead guilty is SBF, ironically. He's basically pointing the finger at everybody else. Um, this article says, in July 2019, shortly after the exchange opened for business, Bankman Freed directed him, talking about Gary Wang, to write code that would let Alameda's FTX balance fall below zero. Sam told me to make sure Alameda's accounts would never get liquidated on FTX, Wang said. So... You know, we're kind of getting, we're kind of digging up all this information about like the whole FTX scam and and scandal and how it all kind of developed. Um, so, you know, Gary Wang's testimony kind of brought a lot of light to the shadows of what uh, SBF was doing in the background the whole time. Um, so definitely interesting to read his testimony. I think Caroline Ellison's is probably going to be even more fascinating than this. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, personal information that comes out. So she is set to testify this week. Uh, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very interesting, both from a personal and from a professional perspective. It's going to give us a lot of light into, you know, what SBF is really like, because obviously he had this whole persona that he built up and, and most of it, you know, was just a complete facade. Um, so Zero Hedge has been tracking uh, the U.S. debt that keeps getting added to the balance sheet um, uh, for the past, you know, several, several weeks. I mean, he's been going back for months, uh, but obviously in the last couple of weeks, it's, it's really ramped up. So I've been following it obviously in these daily, uh, podcasts. So, and just 18 days later, we are $33.5 trillion. That's 28.5 billion in new debt per day and on pace to add another trillion in 1.5 months. So the U S debt is, is absolutely skyrocketing. Obviously in COVID, you can see here, uh, in this chart, it, you have a huge spike uh, from COVID in 2020. Um, and then recently, you know, at the end of 2023, we've seen another huge spike, you know, in, in one single day, we added like $270 billion in debt. Uh, and that amount just keeps getting, you know, the, the amount of daily debt just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, so it keeps getting worse. Um, and a lot of people are saying that eventually this, this is going to explode and something needs to be done about it. So does that mean the Fed needs to step in and do something? We'll have to see the high interest rates that are ironically created by the Fed are now creating a lot of new debt because the U.S., the previous debt from the U.S. is now getting serviced at a much higher interest rate. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, I think all of this is very much leading to the Fed needing to ease markets and do quantitative easing, easing as opposed to quantitative, quantitative tightening. Say that 
10 times fast. Um, so we're in a period of QT right now. And if they want to fix what's going on right now, we need to enter QE, in my opinion. Uh, so they're going to probably enter QE pretty fast. They're going to unwind a lot of the you know interest rate hikes that we've seen. So uh, we'll see how this develops. And then final piece, which is fun news, uh, Joe Rogan on his podcast, obviously is the biggest podcaster in the world, said that Bitcoin has the most likely possibility of becoming a universal viable currency. Uh, he cited Andreas Antonopoulos that was on his podcast a couple of years ago uh, talking about Bitcoin. Um, so he's basically saying, you know, he's a believer in Bitcoin, believes that it has value for the world. Um, and, you know, having people like Joe Rogan talking about Bitcoin will get people to, again, think about Bitcoin kind of like they did in the last bull market. So we're kind of at the beginning of that, that uh, you know, PR hype cycle for Bitcoin, if you will. Uh, so we'll see how that develops. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, have a good weekend. See you guys next week.